we'll go from current slide. Oh, yeah, one more thing I forgot. I need to open this slide too. Okay. Now let's see where we are here. What's the next slide? Yeah, that's coming up. Okay. So let's first, I'm sorry, we already, goodness, almost 45 minutes late getting started. So sorry about that, but I wasn't anticipating having no support. Okay. So um, I'm glad y'all are here, though. And at least three people said some sort of emergency or funerals or something came up that they couldn't be here. Um, let's talk about how things are going to go. We have class tonight. We'll finally get it started. Go to 630. Uh, we'll cover as much as we can of 18. If possible, start in 19. And then on next Wednesday, if y'all are here, start without me because I'm not, Okay. Uh, Thanksgiving week, I don't know if y'all realize it, you have the whole week off. Faculty and staff, we're here Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Uh, not everybody, some people are going to meetings in Montgomery, more power to them. Uh, but I won't be in the office probably Monday or Tuesday, either one, because most of the time our meetings are over on the Birmingham West Campus, and my office is on Bessemer Campus. So I probably won't be in the office Monday or Tuesday. Now, Wednesday, they usually let us go back to our offices. So I will be on the Bassmore campus Wednesday morning at least. Now, the reason I say that, now this isn't required, it's not mandatory, it's only at their pleasure, but most of the time on the day before a big holiday like Thanksgiving, they let people go home a little early. But it's never fixed. No one knows for sure, even if we will get to go. In the past, I can remember maybe one time they let us go home at noon. Most of the time, it's been more like 1, 2, 2.30, something like that. Seems like may have been a time or two we weren't allowed to go home. You went home at the regular time. So nothing's fixed. But while I'm saying this, if you have any business to do with the college next week, all the offices should be open on both campuses Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday morning. But do not bank on very much being open Wednesday afternoon. So don't put off coming in until Wednesday afternoon. There's a good chance the office you go to will be nobody home, just like it was tonight. So uh, get your business taken care of by Wednesday morning, okay? No class next Wednesday. Now, the following Wednesday after we get back, that's our last night of class. And after that class is over, I'll be distributing the last test. That'll be the test on chapters 18 and 19. Uh, magnetism uh, is 18, 19. Actually, the name of it is Alternating Current Electricity, which ties in with magnetism, electromagnetic stuff. So, uh, But the number of questions I had on these three sections in 18 wasn't enough for a test, so I combined them those two together. So I'll pass those out the Wednesday after Thanksgiving, and then the Wednesday after that, <coughs> I'll try to be here from 4.30 until 6.30. So anytime you want to come and turn in the test, you can. If you want to turn it in earlier, I'm on the Bessemer campus Monday through Thursday. I'm on, Bessemer, on Birmingham East campus Friday. So any day after I turn it over, give it to you on next, on the Wednesday after Thanksgiving. Uh, Thursday, and Friday, Thursday, I'm on Bessemer campus, Friday over there, Monday, Tuesday over there, and Tuesday morning until I leave to come here, and then I'm here Tuesday evening. Now, if you miss it and don't get it in by 6.30, then I'm back on Bessemer campus Thursday and on Birmingham campus Friday. So get them in then because that's when finals are done do so Wednesday, right yeah, is our test. is our last day of class and at the end of that class i'll give you the last test you come back here the, next the next wednesday right yeah or earlier or later but i'll be here for the 4 30 6 30 on that wednesday 
Yeah, there's no class that night. All you're doing is turning in the test. That's why I'm saying if it's more convenient to you, turn it in to me on Bessemer campus Monday through Thursday, Birmingham campus Friday, or turn it in here uh, Wednesday evening. And that's all it'll be. Now, if you wanted to, we could probably try to have pizza or something that Wednesday night, and that way you could have some better reason to come to class. But what do you all think? We'll talk about it next week. Uh, two weeks. Okay. All right. Now, where we left off last time. Any questions on anything we've covered so far? Now, if not, where the... Okay. Since I can't remember, I know at least one of you... Yeah, one of you was not here last time. So let me go through... A little bit of review here. If you have a direct current, not alternating current, a direct current flowing through a wire, okay? Before I say that, let me give you a little axiom, okay? What creates a magnetic field is a moving charge. A moving charge creates a magnetic field. And Direct current is charge moving in one direction. The reason you can't use alternating current is it's doing this very rapidly, so the field would be doing this, and it would just cancel each other out. So it's only direct current uh, going through a wire. And here is the rule of thumb, literally. If you point your thumb in the direction of the conventional current, that's going from high potential to low potential, from plus side of the battery, to the low side of the battery, minus side. If you put your th right thumb in the direction, your fingers are going to indicate the direction of the field lines. And that's exactly how they look. If you put a little compass there, it would line up this way. If you put it there, it would line up this way. Here, it would line up this way. It would point in the direction of these field lines. And that's the right-hand rule, okay? If you point your finger in the direction of the current flow, your fingers on your right hand curl in the direction of your current. Okay, we talked about that last time. Now, this is a fairly weak field. In order to make that a strong field, you have to send an awful lot of current through that wire. And direct current through a wire, a huge amount of it is going to heat up the wire. Okay, probably bubble the insulation. Okay, it's just not a good deal. Okay. So most of the time, that's not going to create enough of a field for you to really do much with. Now, picture this. Take that straight wire and bend it into a loop. Okay? Now, take your right hand, and if the current's flowing in this direction around that loop, then your field lines are going this way and that way. So this would be now. They're reinforcing because all around the loop, they're pointing inside the loop. Okay? If the current's flowing in this direction. So therefore, you set up a stronger magnetic field. This is a fairly weak field here, but that whole loop, they're all pointing in the same direction, so that reinforces. That's a single coil. Okay? Guess what we'll do? We'll do a bunch of coils. And that makes a stronger and stronger and stronger field and in fact, if you have enough coils and enough current, which now you don't need that much current, you can cr create a magnetic field stronger than any bar magnet you'll ever find. Any horseshoe magnet. Really, really strong magnetic field. Okay? So, yeah, I just sat on my thumb. If a wire is bent into a loop, this is on page 509, its magnetic field lines become bunched up or concentrated in the center of the loop. If you do a second and subsequent loop, you increase the intensity of that magnetic field of the loop even more. And you can just keep increasing and keep increasing. Now, probably there's a point of diminishing returns, but you can create a very, very strong magnetic field. To determine the direction of the flux lines, that's what we call them, magnetic field lines, the flux lines of a current in a loop, you use Ampere's rule, which I was just describing, okay? Um, and if several 
loops are made into a tight spiral, you know, big long coil, as shown in figure 814. Unfortunately, your book doesn't show that. No, I'm sorry, it does. This is 814, okay? If you do a whole bunch of uh, coils, now that's not very many there, but look at those concentrated field lines. Now here's your current going up like this, and it looks like they're doing this, so the North Pole is, sure enough, coming out this way, the South Pole is this way, so your field lines always go from the North Pole to the South Pole, point away from the North, point to the South. So you have a very strong South Pole here, very strong North Pole there. Okay, this device, the magnetic field in a coil, this is showing iron filings. They're showing you where those field lines are. It's not just some picture. Those are the iron filings lining up. And notice how much they're grouped in here and on the ends and how they're scattered out here. Okay? Um, if the coil of wire passes repeatedly through, a, okay, oh, they're just saying you made the coil through a white surface here so you can see the field lines. Okay. The compass also represents the magnetic field in the wire. Uh, here's a coil. Now, usually the, the red is the positive, but I can't see which way it's going here. But if I could make out this, it looks like the north, the, the, the little compasses here are pointing just like this. Okay, so this would be the north, that would be the south, if I'm reading it right. Okay, okay. Just like this is going the opposite direction, these look like it's going that direction. And it does the same thing up here, too. Okay. Now, definition. A coil of tightly wrapped wire is called a solenoid. I thought they were going to say it here, but they didn't. Let me get my pen set up. Sorry about my voice. It hasn't come back. Okay. A uh, coil... Of, they say tightly wrapped, that's sort of a nebulous type term there, uh, but I'll put it down. Um, wire, I thought they would say coils, but they don't just say wire, is called a solenoid. Now, I doubt that if, when, if and when you become uh, diagnostic medical sonography technicians, I doubt that you'll probably have to get into the mechanics of it. You know, you'll have to know how to use the equipment and stuff, but if you start seeing something go wrong, then you'll know to tell somebody, okay? And you would anyway. But this could be what's going on. Solenoids are used all over in technical equipment. They're all over the place, okay? Uh, and you have all this in your text as well, okay? Now, and, excuse me just a minute, I'll get my book back here. Tierra, all right. I have a tiara in one of my other classes, and she insists on being R, right? It spells it just like you, but so I have to always look and see, is this a tiara or a tiara? Okay. <coughs> What's that? I, I wanted to call you what you want to be called. Okay. Now, if you flip over to page 510, it says, for a long coil, let's see if they may have a picture of this. No, they don't. For a long coil that is tightly turned, remember they said that, tightly wrapped, uh, the field strength at the center, okay, I'm going to write it here since it's pretty close to this. Uh, field strength, magnetic field strength, the symbol is B. I don't know if you remember, electric field, the symbol was capital E. That made sense. B 
I don't know where they got it. Okay, capital B, uh, that's the magnetic field strength uh, in the region at the center of the solenoid. Now, when they say the center, they don't mean this center here, you know, they mean the center of the solenoid coming out here or here, going in or coming out here or here. That's what they mean by the center. That's where they're measuring this. The field strength um, at the center of the solenoid, B, is used this formula. Now, if you were here last time, you may remember mu naught. Now, mu naught is, again, a permeability constant. Now, number one, I don't even know why they call it permeability, okay? It doesn't seem like that fits what we're talking about, but that's the term they use for it. And that permeability constant is 4 pi times 10 to the 7th, I believe it is, minus 7, Tesla meters per amp, okay? And you'll see why the units are out like they are. Okay, so mu naught times I, of course, this is the current, the strength of the current in amps, okay, and your N is the number of turns per unit length of the solenoid. The number of turns per unit length. Okay, so if you're measuring in meters, it would be so many terms per meter. That's pretty long length, so they may use centimeters, they use inches, feet, whatever. The number of turns per unit length, okay? The longer the solenoid in relation to its radius, so the radius is the diam you know, is how big the circle is, the coil is, the tight this is, and the length is this way. The longer the solenoid is in relation to the radius, the more uniform the magnetic field is inside that solenoid, okay? Uh, for an infinitely long solenoid, which is sort of hard to imagine, the value of B is uniform throughout, okay? You don't have infinite solenoids, but you have very long ones, and then the magnitude would be very close to being uh, uh, uniform throughout. So let's do example two. Okay, I think I'll need to go to the previous, to the other slide to do it. So let me pull that one up. We'll go from current slide. Here we go. Find the magnetic field at the center of a solenoid that is 0 0.425 meters long. I have to get my pen back. Okay, so this is a length of 0 0.425 meters. Now, that's a little less than half a meter. Half a meter would be about a little more than 18 inches, 19, 20 inches, something like that. Pretty close to 20 inches, okay? This is a pretty long, well, this is a little less than that, so this would probably be more in the order of half or a little bit less, you know, 18, 15 to 18 inches. Pretty good size solenoid. And 0 0.070 meters in diameter. So the diameter is 0 0.0750. And that's the diameter. Now, that's a pretty small number. But if you move the decimal two places, 7.5 centimeters. Now, a centimeter is approximately the, the distance across your little fingernail. So if you think of seven and a half little fingernails across, don't cut yours in two, you know, uh, that would be about what your diameter is. So it's a pretty big one around, too, but nothing close to uh, 15 to 18 inches long. Okay. And has three layers of 850 turns each. So we have three layers of 850 turns 
each, each layer. Okay, ugly writing. Okay, three layers of 850 turns each. Okay, when a 0 0.250 amps flows throughout, what in the world does 0 0.250 amps? What does that measure? What does amperage measure? Last chapter. Oh, come on. Measures current. That's the other thing we don't know here. Okay. What's our formula? We're looking for the magnetic field, so we're looking... The thing we don't know is B. That's the unknown here. Find the magnetic field at the center of this. So what's the formula? B is equal to mu naught I times N. Where mu naught is a constant, 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 Tesla meters per amp. I'll make sure I got it right. Yeah, Tesla meters per amp. That's your mu, mu naught, permeability constant. The I they just gave us is 0 0.250 amps. <coughs> right at a quarter of an amp, which is probably fairly common amperage. Current usually doesn't come in too big of numbers, unless you're producing an awful lot of heat. Solenoids usually don't. Okay? But then, what's the N? What is this N? Remember? Number of turns per length. Okay? Now, they told us how many turns it was in the whole solenoid. 850 turns in three layers, so that would be 3 times 850, which is 0, 5, 41. 4,150 turns. That's a lot of turns, okay? But it's per unit length. What was the length of this? 0 0.2425, 0 0.2, I can't write. 425, I said I just can't write. I was saying 4 and wrote a 2. 425 meters. So that's per unit length. That's going to make this number even bigger. So we could just write it down like this if we wanted to. 4150 turns. Now turns isn't really a unit. But meters is. Oh, wait, huh. I left off my number there. Well, my eraser's not coming up. There we go. Uh, 0 0.425. Now, let's just take a look at it. The meters are going to cancel out. The amperage are going to cancel out. And you're left with Tesla. That's what we measure magnetic field strength in, Tesla. Named after, uh, goodness, what's his first name? Nikolai, I think it was, Nikolai Tesla. A guy from Serbia, I believe, uh, either Serbia or Croatia won. And he was a brilliant, brilliant scientist and engineer. Not a very good businessman, though. He never could make any money. Uh, he always had ideas that were far bigger than his is uh, resources. So let's see what we've got here. Now, if you got your calculator, good time to use it. 4 pi, 4 times pi. Hopefully your calculator has a pi key on it. If it doesn't, you can use 3.1416. Okay? But if it has a pi t key, just 4 times pi. Now, don't do a times 10. Do an EE on your calculator or EXP. 
find one of those two keys, EE or EXP, and press it, and then press negative 7. What's that? Is that 4? 4 pi, 4 times pi. Uh, EE or EXP, do you find that key? Okay, then do you know how to do a negative 7? That's not the subtraction key minus, that's a minus key in parentheses. You see that? Okay, negative 7 times 0 0.250, you can just do 0 0.25, times 4,150 divided by 0.425. Equal. Okay. Sounds like we may have missed a, a factor there somewhere. Um, okay. 4 pi e to e, e or exp negative 7 times uh, 0 0.250 times 4150 divided by uh, 0 0.425. I'm not sure what the book has is right, but it's not what you were saying. It seems like we were only off by a factor of two. No, yeah, I believe it was two. You still got the same thing? Let me come watch. They may have made a mistake in the book. I don't have a calculator here with me. Okay, first do this. 4150 divided by 0.425. Do that one. 0.425. What do you get? Say again. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, maybe I made a mistake. Oh, I did make a mistake. Yuck. I know where the error is. It wasn't the calculator. Well, it was a calculator, but it wasn't a mechanical one. Okay. I was doing, I don't know what I was doing. Okay. All right. 3 times 0 is 0. 3 times 5 is 15. Carry 1. 3 times 8 is 24. And 1 is 25. So that's the number you should have there. 2550, not 4150. And we were off by almost a factor of 2. What you get? <coughs> What's that? <coughs> oh, just like before, only it's 2550 rather than 4150. 4 times pi, EE e or EXP, negative 7 times 0. 0.25 times 2550 divided by 0. 0.420, 425, sorry. That's exactly it. And that would be Tesla, which is, Tesla is a big unit, so that's why it's a pretty small number. They wrote it in the book of 1.88 times 10 to the, you move the decimal three places, minus three. Tesla. That's exactly right. All right. And that finishes 18.2. I'd say homework exercises here, try to do one or three, and any of the other odds, five through 13. Okay? Now, I do think I want to at least cheat a little bit and do a little bit in 18.3 just because it follows so directly from what we just did. Does anyone need this a little longer? Okay. 
I'm going to go back to my slide set and hope they have the next slide in there. No, they don't. Well, they kind of do. But let's go back to this slide, okay? These are pictures, illustrations of solenoids. Do you want to know how to make a solenoid stronger? Put an iron core or some magnetic uh, material core in the middle of the solenoid. Okay? Now, what are our three naturally occurring magnetic materials? Elements. Iron nickel and cobalt that's it folks copper no tin no silver no gold no none of the others iron nickel and cobalt those are the only three naturally occurring magnetic materials iron is the most common and most prevalent so it's all over the place put anything made out of iron and most metals that you use are made out of iron put it in the middle of a solenoid you have now made an electromagnet because the filings, the uh, materials, the atomic setup in your iron starts aligning with the field here and becomes even stronger. It now becomes a magnet. And we call that an electromagnet. Because it doesn't get its magnetism from naturally occurring, it gets its magnetism from the electric current flowing through the coil. That's called an electromagnet. And that's what 18.3 uh, is talking about. It's pretty interesting, amazing, and useful stuff, but we're not covering it, okay? Uh, it's beyond what we're doing here. But that's just a direct increase from what we're doing, what we just talked about, okay? Now, this is what this figure is illustrating. If you have just a regular old piece of iron, okay, one that's not been magnetized, wasn't naturally occurring, the, okay, iron, nickel, and cobalt, the reason they're the only naturally occurring magnetic materials, their atoms, down on the atomic level, every one of them's a little magnet. It's just the way that the electrons spin around the nucleus it just happens to produce little magnetic fields. Now, most of the time in regular old iron, those fields are pointing every way imaginable, so they cancel each other out. They're not naturally occurring magnets. However, there are places on the Earth where they have found rock, iron rock, that is naturally magnetic. Now, what happened there, and this is beyond what you really need to know, but it's sort of interesting, happened to be there was probably a volcanic eruption about that time. The magma, which is mostly iron, came to the surface, and if it happened to land and line up with the Earth's magnetic field and then solidify, then it became slightly magnetized. Okay? Now, what you're looking at here is you see more of the arrows are pointing to the right. These are the individual atoms. Here's four, six, two the other way. Four more, two more, uh, two more, two more, four more. So more of them are pointing this way. So this is a weak magnet, slightly north pole, south pole. And this again is why you can't have a north pole without a south pole. You can never have a magnetic north pole. But if you put that, either this one or that one, in an electromagnet inside a coil, a solenoid, boy, most of them, not all of them, but they line up like crazy. That becomes a very, very strong magnet. Okay, so that's how you make an electromagnet. Now, if you wanted to make this magnet even stronger without using electricity, get you a strong magnet and just stroke it in the same direction every time you hit and jar those things, then they start to line up according to that magnetic field, and it gets stronger and stronger up to the strength of the thing you're uh, stroking it against. So that's how they make 
magnets. Okay, probably more than what you wanted to know. Uh, section 18.4 is talking about induced current, which is another interesting feature of, of uh, magnetism, and it shows the connection between magnetism and electricity. And here's a sample of that. This is what they call a DC generator. What it takes to make a DC generator is, this is direct current generator. It's a magnetic, strong north magnet here, strong south magnet here. So you have a very strong <coughs> field <coughs> pointing from north to south. And in this, you have a coil. Now, they show this is rectangular. A lot of times, they really do make them that way. It could be any kind of coil. Now, here's the key. The number of field lines being cut by that core, coil determines how strong your current is. Okay? Now, when it's turned like this, it's not cutting very many field lines at all because it's parallel with the field line. But when you turn it on a little bit further and get it like this, lots of field lines are cutting that, okay? And then turn it more and more. So what you have, you have a turning coil inside a fixed strong magnetic field. Now, that would be creating positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, alternating current. But to keep it from doing alternating current, we put what they call a commutator here, a split ring commutator, and that commutes it. When it turns like this and is going positive, then the current flows like this. And then right about the time it would turn negative, it flips the polarity, and it sends it back the same way again. So that's why it becomes a DC generator. Again, more than you needed to know, but it's, a, uh, it's stuff we will kind of be talking about later, okay? So I was just going to go through these pretty quickly, okay? Now, that was how you generate electricity using magnetic fields. See, electromagnetism, they're closely interrelated. Now, remember what I said before? A moving charge induces a magnetic field. Well, the flip side of that is a changing magnetic field creates an electric current. A moving charge creates a magnetic field. A changing magnetic field creates a current. That's why when you turn this coil inside the magnetic field, you're constantly changing the, the number of field lines that's being cut, in which direction they're being cut. So that's producing a current through the, through the wire. No battery needed, okay? This is how, um, have you ever started a lawnmower? Okay, you have to, it's pretty hard to crank, right? You have to really pull on that. What you're doing is turning a coil inside a very strong magnetic field, they call it a magneto, and that starts the current going, and that's what gets your lawnmower going. And then that feeds your spark plug, and that's what it does, and then it just keeps itself running. Okay, that's what your starter on your car does. When you turn the thing, it, an electric motor, turns that uh, starter motor and makes it turn, and then the car starts running itself. Okay, so same deal. Okay, now on the other hand, this is a generator, what I was just doing. This is a motor. Here's the motor principle. Okay, if you have a fixed, well, Let's not get into that. That's more than we, the nature of this course is. Um, probably more than we need here, too. And that's, wait a minute. We're supposed to get to 18.7, and 18.6 is the motor principle.
goodness gracious. Yeah, this is, this is the one and only slide in 18.7. Uh, magnetic forces on moving charged particles. Okay, let me make sure this is right. Yep, that's it. Magnetic forces on moving charged particles. Basically, what your outline said, or your course description said, you needed to talk about magnetic forces and fields. This is the only way place they talk about the forces, except back in Ampere's Law, or, yeah, Ampere's Law. So here's what we're, and, and this is it. There's not much here, but this is it. Now, what you have is a beam of electrons. Well, guess what a beam of electrons is? Moving charges. Moving charges. Electrons are charged. Minus one charge. So you have a beam of electrons moving. And what if they interact with the magnetic field? What happens is the magnetic field bends that beam of electrons. It alters the course of that current you might say. Okay? And here's how it does it. I wish they had a little bit better uh, illustration of this, but this is what you got. If you put your fingers in the, in your right hand, always the right hand, if you put your fingers in the right hand in the direction of the magnetic field, field lines, that would be in this picture going this way, okay? And then your electron beam, okay, I thought this looked backwards. Because this is an electron beam, these are negative charges. So basically, you start this way. Put your finger in the direction of the electron beam uh, on your right hand, okay? And then twist your fingers in the direction of the field lines, and that then shows the force moving upwards, okay? So frankly, it looks like this is not quite right. This should be bending up rather than bending out. Now maybe it is. Maybe it's coming down here and bending up there. Uh, like I said, just one picture, and that's all she wrote. Okay? So that's how magnetic forces influence charged particles. If those are positive charges, like alpha particles, it bends on the other way because those are positively charged particles. But this kind of deal where you have one force, one field in this direction, another field in that direction, the force resulting is perpendicular to both of those fields. That's what we, you don't need to know this, but this is what we, illustrating what they mean by uh, the cross product of two vectors or vector fields produces another vector perpendicular to both of them. And that's all. That's all there is in that last section. So we're ready for chapter 19. Okay? Uh, that was the one and only slide in, in the two paragraphs they had in 18.7. So let's move to 19. And, uh, wow, this is moving faster than I thought it would be. Okay, let me leave this one and go to this one, chapter 19. All right. Get the slideshow set up from current slide. <coughs> <coughs> now, if you remember back in basic electricity, that was chapter 17, that you're all, I think, got your tests on now, except those who turn them in already, okay? In that, we're talking about mostly direct current. Now we're going to be talking about alternating current. Where alternating current comes from, as I sort of mentioned before, from generators. Direct current basically comes from batteries. Direct uh, alternating current comes from generators. Where do we have generators? Where do you have a power plant? Okay, the 
if you have a hydroelectric plant or a dam, Smith Lake Dam, all these dams around here, they are generating alternating current. If you have a coal-fired power plant, a natural gas-fired power plant, nuclear power plant, those are, you're, you're using the fuel or the nuclear energy to, the heat from that to boil water, get superheated steam, and superheated steam goes through your turbines, steam turbines, and that produces your electricity. These, I mean, alternating, because anytime you have a generator, that's alternating current, unless you have one of those commutators on the split beam commutator. So that's what we're talking about now is alternating current. Okay? Now, we're basically going to focus on 19.3, but I'm going to give you the quick slideshow, uh, and I think I just lost my place. Ah, it opened back to it. Uh, here we go. So exactly some of those things I mentioned in the last chapter about generators. Now we're here. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Wow. Okay. What we have here is basically your current flow in an alternating current. Okay? Let's just start it for no better place at zero. And then just think of that coil moving in the inside the magnetic field as more field lines are being cut by that coil your current increases. When the maximum <coughs> number of field lines are being cut, or actually the maximum rate of increase, that's when you're at your max here. But then it starts decreasing as fewer field lines are being cut. And when you get here, you're back to zero again. But it doesn't sit at zero, it's constantly changing. It immediately flips over and becomes a negative current. Okay, that's why we call it alternating. And then it, immediately, it slows down and starts increasing again, goes to zero again, goes back to maximum. So max here, zero here, minimum there, maximum back over there. They left off this zero there, it's fine. All right, that's why we call it alternating current. And if you think about it, <coughs> what that means the charge carriers, electrons or whatever, they're doing this, just back and forth, very rapid. How far they move before they turn back, I don't know. I don't even have a clue, but that's all they're doing. However long or short it is, they're just moving back and forth. But it's the energy they're giving up that produces the load, the lights, the sound, the heat, the uh, whatever you're, you're producing, okay? This is alternating current. Now, this is just background here. Obviously, to create alternating current, you have to have an alternating voltage. <coughs> Excuse me. These aren't really cough drops. They're just ginger candy, but ginger just seems wonderful to my throat. So. <coughs> run all over campus so that doesn't get me coughing but when I start talking too much and y'all say I always talk too much you said that didn't you? I heard you okay. uh, what? just kidding oh. <laughs> no. no you would never say a thing like that would you no, no. okay in order to produce an alternating current you would have to have an alternating uh, voltage as well. Okay? This is yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see that it. I can't hear you. Yeah, it smells funny in here. Is this something over there? Like, what's in that building over there? It smells funny in here. I can't feel it. Like some type of building? The yeah. building right next door? Mm -hmm. Acrylic or something? Smell, you said. I don't know, it just smells funny. No, like, I don't know, is it paint? 
Well, I was going to say culinary arts is over there, but I would think they wouldn't approve of your describing your smell like that. They would have told us, though. Yeah. But, um, wrong. See, I've got a stuffed up head, so I can't tell. You, look, you don't see any smoke that you can tell or, or no. like that looks like pine. <coughs> Actually, as soon as you said that, I thought it looked like it could be smoky outside, but I think it's just that bright light going through the fire department did though. But if you smell it more when you go outside, try calling uh, campus police if you got that number in. Okay, I just tried to see what you Okay, I'm not going to focus on this much, but I just wanted to remind you, power is voltage times current. I think we hit that in the last chapter, but if we didn't, it's a good thing to know. Power in watts is equal to voltage times current. Voltage is energy per unit charge, which is joules per coulomb. Current is how many charges pass in a second, time rate of change of charge. That's coulombs per second. So the coulombs cancel out and you get joules per, per second, and that's exactly what a watt is, joule per second. So this is just a, a slide that demonstrates that. And how the power is always positive if your current and your voltage, which they usually are in phase like this, your power is always positive, and you usually just deal with the average power. But don't sweat that. You don't need to know it. Okay? Now, let me see which section this is in. This may be one that you do need to know. Yeah. Okay. This is 19.2. I don't think that was one I said. No. But it is pretty important. So let's, let me at least run this by you. And frankly, I think this may be up right. This may be on your test. So it is important to know. This is basically outlining what a transformer is and what a transformer does. And the reason I'm including this, what we are going to hit, inductance and capacitance, this is involved with that. So I did want you to know this. If you have an AC source here, anything you plug into the wall, that doesn't have a box on it that converts it to DC, okay? Anything that you, uh, alternating current. If you have a lot of coils on this side, that's the primary side, that's the side that you're feeding into, but fewer coils on the other side, then this is what you call a step-down transform. If you've got 120 volts coming in here, and you have... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let's call it ten coils here. And one, two, three, four, let's call it five coils there. This is going to step down from 120 volts to 60 volts. So that's a low voltage transform. Okay? If you had 240 volts coming in here, that would step down to 120. If you had um, 720 coming in, that would step down to 360. That probably is pretty close, if not exactly, what goes on outside your house. Uh, if you go to where the wires come into your, wherever you live, house, apartment, whatever, go look for the wires coming in. 
And back on the first power pole, you'll see you'll see a big cylindrical looking device there. That's a transformer. It's exactly what it's doing. The reason that we do it, that they do it, where you lose energy is high currents. Okay? Because current, there's more interactions in the wire, things heat up. Okay? So usually coming in or going across. Have you ever noticed these big old steel towers and they usually have all the trees cut out from them and stuff and they run across the road, the, the, uh, the interstate or the roads and stuff, the big, big power. Okay. Guarantee that's really, really, really high voltage. The higher the voltage, the lower the current. Let's go back a slide or two. This one right here. The power, if the power is the same, and it is usually, whatever power is produced, that's the, that's the energy per second. The energy is conserved. If you step up the voltage, you drop the current. If you step down the voltage, you go up in current. Okay? Because the power is fixed. The power can't be changed. So that's what these transformers do. They either step up or step down the power. Okay? This one's stepping down. Because when they were moving the electricity across town, they wanted to use a higher voltage so they had less line loss, less heat resistance. And then when they got to your house, they dropped it down so it wouldn't burn out your equipment in your house. So they dropped it down and they had a, a uh, um, step-down transform. At these power stations, whether hydroelectric, nuclear, coal-fired, natural gas, whatever the power station is, they're producing electricity and then they have transformers there that step it up like crazy. Just flip this one around and have very few coils on this side and a bunch of coils on that side, you're producing an incredibly large voltage. Then, very little current. You can send that electricity miles and miles and miles and it won't have a lot of line loss. There's always a little, but not much. If you went down in voltage, up in current, much more line loss. Okay? So, that's what transformers do. They either step up or step down the voltage, and of course the current goes in the opposite direction because they're inversely related. Okay, this was in 19.2, which is AC power. Okay, this is another step-down transformer. Now, I didn't explain why this happens. That was what we were talking about before. This looks a lot like a solenoid. In fact, it looks a lot like an electromagnet, doesn't it? Because this is an iron core inside a coil of wire. So what you're doing with the current, and this is alternating current, so it's always changing. Now remember, it's a changing current produces a magnetic field. So this is making this into a big magnet. Well, then the changing magnetic field here, because this changing electric field here, the changing electric, a magnetic field here, a changing magnetic field produces an electric current, and it'll also be alternating. So that produces a changing current here, and so you see it's all a matter of the fields. The changing electric field creates a changing magnetic field, the changing magnetic field creates a different changing electric field. That's how this works, okay? Now, Alternating current in the primary coil produces a alternating current in the second coil, but it's in proportion to the number of coils. So this will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 11, 10 again, 5 again. So yeah, that's going to be a step-down transformer by a factor of 2. The magnetic field induced in the core by the primary current then creates a different uh, it's the same magnetic field here, but fewer turns, so you get a lower voltage coming out of the uh, secondary side.
This is a step up transformer because on the primary side you have fewer coils, more coils on the secondary side. So this might go from uh, 120 volts to 240 volts or something like that. Okay, however, this would be going the other way from 240 to 120 or something like that. <coughs> We put up some outdoor lighting in our, around our house, and we, over there, we're near where we plugged it into the plug, there was a big box that made a fair amount of noise, not lots of noise, but you, know, you could just hear it humming when it was working, and you could feel some heat in there because that was a transformer stepping down, so 120 volt went down to something like 6 or 8 volts. The reason for that, they didn't want a lot of high voltage there in case someone shoveling hit it, they wouldn't get, you know, electrocuted. It wouldn't be enough voltage to do that. Okay. So this is typically what's happening. Here's your generating station. They're showing a hydroelectric plant. <coughs> The kinetic energy of the water is turning the turbines. The turbines are turning those, you know, in a strong magnetic field, turning coils of wires, producing electricity. And then you step up at a, at a transfer station in very high power. Look at that, 132,000 volts. I guarantee that's not got much current in it, very little current. So the very little line on. Then it goes to a substation right outside town, or maybe in town, and this steps it down to around 6,000 volts. So a lot of step-down transformers in there. And then it gets to your house, and it steps down from 6,000 to somewhere either 220 or 110. 220 runs things like your, like I actually used to use 240, or use that as a reference. It's somewhere in between the two. That runs things like your hot water heater. If you have air conditioning units, most of those are 240. Your range, your stove. Have you ever noticed the plug on your dryer? It's different from the plug you plug here. It's a three-prong plug, a big old three-prong plug. That's because it's 240. Because anything that uses a lot, a lot of heat, they need the 240. Anything that just uses common stuff, that's the 110. Okay? The regular plugs like this are 110. And I can't believe, I cannot believe that's the last slide in this chapter. And we haven't even gotten to the part where we're going to focus on. That's amazing. 19.3 is where we actually begin. Let me make sure that's right. Is that what I said before? Yep, 19.3. Inductance. Not a single slide in inductance. So I'm going to be through with this slide, okay? And we're going to do everything on this piece of paper, on this slide, the white slide. Okay. Inductance. Okay. So without any slides, I do a lot of writing. Sorry about that. It's going to be ugly. <laughs> <coughs> Let me get my pen back. Okay. Inductance. Now, I'm not really all that sure of why they want you to know about inductance, but I'll try to make up something as I go. Okay? This measures the tendency... These are all sort of weasel words here. Of a coil of wire to resist a change in the current Okay. Because of the magnetism produced 
by one part of the coil acts to oppose the change of the current in the other parts of the coil. Now, that's a long sentence. Uh, because the magnetism in producing by one part of the coil acts to oppose I don't know why he doesn't say just opposes but I'm trying to use the same words he does opposes uh, acts to oppose uh, the change in the current in other parts of the coil Boy, some figures would be helpful here. Okay? Now, along with that, an inductor. So that's inductance. An inductor, <coughs> that's an N there, that's a pretty ugly N. An inductor is a circuit component. Now remember, in the electricity chapter, basically the only circuit elements we were interested in was the generator, the battery, whatever you had there producing the energy, uh, giving the energy to the charges, the wires, which were your pathway, and then the usually resistors. Resistors then use the energy that the battery supplied. An inductor is another circuit component it's somewhat similar in some ways to an inductor, I mean to a resistance, but not quite the same. An inductor is a circuit component, such as a coil, a coil of wire. Okay, I thought they would understand that to be a wire, but they put a coil of wire in which the induced EMF opposes any change in the current. Okay. Sounds like they're almost running in circles, doesn't it? They kind of are, okay? Um, now, remember uh, that coil of wire, anytime you have a coil of wire, <coughs> with a changing uh, current in it, you're monkeying around with the magnetic field really strongly. Now this is alternating current, so you're not really going to produce an electromagnet because that required direct current. But these coils of wire are going to kind of moderate the changes that are happening. Notice here, induced EMF. EMF is another voltage. Okay? So when you have voltage going in one direction, you run into a coil, that coil is going to produce a magnetic field that is going to oppose every change that you have. So if this one's going this way, it's going this way just the same way. It's not as strong, but that's why it induces an EMF and it opposes the change in the current. Now, the unit of inductance, and by the way, inductance is given the symbol capital L. Do not ask me why. 
it doesn't seem like that would be what you would name an inductance, capital L. The unit of inductance is a Henry, named after Joseph Henry, uh, who did a whole lot of the work on this. Born in Albany, New York, constructed the first electromagnetic motor, discovered electric induction, okay, probably when he was doing the motors, demonstrated the oscillatory nature of electric discharges, he introduced a system of weather forecasting, investigated the proposition of light and sound waves. Wow, he did a lot. So the Henry is named after him, and because it's a person, it's capitalized, Henry. So one Henry is an enormous, an enormous uh, unit, okay? The Henry is a large unit, and its definition is one ohm second. Now, that's a strange uh, combination. Ohm measures resistance, and second measures time, okay? Uh, a more practical unit, what you'll usually see, is a millihenry, which is one thousandth of a henry, and that would be a more practical use. You never run into one henry, okay? It's just that it's one ohm times one second. Okay. Inductance is illustrated by connecting a coil with a large number of turns in a lamp in series. Okay. All right. When connected to a DC source, direct current, the lamp burns brightly. However, when this current is connected to AC power source, the lamp is dimmer because of the inductance of a coil. You see, in a DC circuit, that coil is going to do nothing to diminish it. Maybe create a little more resistance in the line, but that's all. Okay? But when you have it in an AC circuit, now <coughs> it's resisting every one of those changes in current flow because it's alternating, and every time it does, it reduces the brightness. So, have any of you ever operated a dimmer switch? You haven't? Okay. Like in our dining room. It doesn't work anymore, but it used to. You push it in, the light came on. But if you turn the knob, it got brighter or dimmer. Okay? Guess what you're doing? You're changing the inductance of the thing. You're increasing the inductance or decreasing the inductance. Okay? Now, the symbology for this in your circuit diagrams is this. Most of the time, we're dealing with alternating current. So they make the, rather than a battery, which looked like this, parallel plates, one long and one short. This is the positive side. That's the negative side. Current always flows pretty much in one direction. Okay? Wouldn't make any sense to have an inductor in that. That just acts like an electromagnet. Okay, that's all. But in an alternating current, which we, this is your power support, looks like a generator. Uh, an inductor looks like this, like a coil. Okay? Now the books doesn't do theirs as tight, as loose as mine is, but you get the general idea. Remember, a resistor is like this. An inductor is like this. This is an L, this is an R. Okay. Now, this is where things get a little tricky. Okay. A resistor produces resistance, of course, right? Re resist the current flow because it's using the energy for something else producing heat, producing light, producing sound, doing something. Okay. An inductive, an inductor kind of changes the energy somewhat. And the, what well, instead of talk, calling it resistance, we call it reactance. And there are different kinds of reactance. 
<coughs> okay? I think I'll go to a clean page to, to address this. Okay? The opposition to current flow in an inductor is called inductive reactance. That was supposed to be a T, and somehow I put a bar of it. The opposition, not quite resistance, but opposition to AC current flow in an inductor is called If that was outright resistance, we call it resistance. It's opposition, so we call that inductive reactance. Now, maybe reactance is a really good term for that. I don't know. It doesn't exactly resist, but it reacts to it. It's tried to oppose it, okay? And that's called inductive reactance. It's measured in ohms, just like resistance is, because it's like resistance. It's just opposition, not resisting, okay? Uh, and it's represented by X sub L. Remember, L is inducting, so this is the reactance due to an inductor, X sub L, okay? And do we have... Let's just start next time at that point. Uh, Shucks. This thing pops out on the least little. Well, actually, I don't need it in there. I've already shut it down. Okay. Uh, I had a pencil here somewhere. There it is. We will start next time with inductive reactants. Near the bottom of page 537. Now, next time is our last time. Okay? We don't come next Wednesday. It's the Wednesday after that. Good deal. Thank you. And, uh, did you grade the Did you turn it in before today? Yeah, yeah. It's graded. I can't return them because not everybody's turned them in. However, I've gotten more in, but I know at least one person wasn't here. Probably more than that. So let me see. That was. There it is. Very good. What's that? Oh. Yeah. It, I'm so clogged up, I probably wouldn't be able to smell a skunk. Well, I probably wouldn't smell a skunk. I had five right there. At first, yeah. in my test over there, I had negative five right there at first. Yeah. I changed it to negative three. Yeah. I had that first. Yeah. That's still a good score, though. Yeah. I gave you half. Huh? Drop the low score. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, then you're in really good shape. Yeah. All right. You too. Thanks.